Welcome back to 65 Drums. My name is Justin Greenwald, and this is the history of electronic drums. Episode 6, the 2010s. Jumping into this new decade, Elise has continued their laser-like focus on entry-level electronic drums. In 2010, they released the Elise's DM6 USB Express drum set, the Elise's DM7 USB, the USB Studio, and the DM10 Studio. While drummers liked the DM10 Pro kit that came before, the metal cymbals were too loud for some people. Elise's decided to release a similar version, this time with rubber cymbals instead. When this was first released, I don't believe Elise's was attempting to replace the DM10 Pro kit, but at some point the DM10 Pro kit was dropped from the product lineup and Elise's stopped making metal cymbal electronic drum sets altogether. Or if you wanted to be technical about it, they stopped selling electronic drum sets with smart trigger cymbals on it. Also, at some point, Elisus would change their shell construction away from using wood over to plastic. Moving over to Roland, they released the SPD-30 Octopad. The Octopad name was a callback to earlier products they made from the 1980s. And by now, Roland had two separate lines of multipads with different feature sets. The new Octopad for dynamic sounds and hi-hat pedal integration, and the SPD, which featured sample import. Splitting those features into two separate multipads and not giving you one pad that did everything kind of was frustrating to some drummers. Meanwhile, over at Simmons, apparently they began to pull drum sets from their online stores. According to a Hellfire Electronic Drums post, it was said there was some sort of pad recall going on for kick drum pads, cymbal pads, and snare pads. Simmons began the process of redesigning those pads in hopes of returning the kits to market soon afterwards. News of a Pearl Electronic Drum set reached drummers in 2009, but it wasn't until 2010 that drummers could actually buy the newly announced Pearl ePro Live. It was priced at $3,200 at release and was positioned as a flagship killer. This drum set looked awesome, and Pearl really tried to lean into the realism angle with this drum set. The drum set featured the same smart trigger symbols that Elise has used on the DM10 Pro, and also a drum module that looks strikingly similar to the DM10, but now with a red coat of paint. The playing surface of the drums was a set of custom rubber pads sitting on Pearl shells. The system was very similar to drum conversion systems from the 1990s, such as Concept One Drums. Pearl just couldn't go with mesh heads yet because Roland still had a 7-year window left until that patent ran out. During its advertising, Pearl stressed that drums could be played with either acoustic heads or electronic heads. These were not high-quality shells, but at least there was a possibility there. The drum set looked better than it sounded, but they did have an interesting feature. You could wipe the module and install a higher resolution kit that took up all the memory. But remember, this is a drum module from 2010, so that one high resolution kit could only have a maximum of 127 megabytes. But at least it was a decent improvement over the stock sounds. Drum plugin partners that sold their kits on the Redbox website included TuneTrack, Steven Slate Drums, F Expansion, VDL2, and Zildjian. Now, of course, these drums would cost you extra, ranging in price from $30 to $50 for each new kit. But they got you in the door with one free kit they were giving away, the 2012 reissue of the Session Studio Classic Series drum set from Pearl. The online store appears to have been taken down sometime around 2020, but you can still see it on the Wayback Machine from internetarchive.com. The strategy of charging extra for more sounds is not new, like some people might think. Electronic drum companies have been doing this since the very beginning. The only difference is that now you didn't have to buy an EEPROM chip or 10 floppy disks just to get access to those sounds. Also, this drum set had a strange limitation of having all of its rim sounds being played back at one volume. They apparently did not configure the pads or maybe the module to send the piezo information about the strength of each hit when the switch was triggered. That's why all the rim hits were one velocity. The Pirelli Pro Live would go through a few evolutions over the decade or so of its existence. The first generation could be purchased with metal cymbals made by Smart Trigger or rubber cymbals made by Medelli. It's not exactly clear when Pearl stopped making this initial version of the drum set. The new version of the drum set had the same sensors for the most part, but now were placed on top of Pearl export shells. There was no drum rack, and the hi-hat was now on a stand. It was a different part. The price tag would eventually hit $2,350 for this drum set. That's almost $1,000 cheaper than the original version with the metal cymbals. I'm guessing Pearl might have found more success with this drum set if it started with that price tag originally. While doing the research for this series, I've noticed a couple of things about Pearl that make them very different from other companies in this space. The first thing that makes Pearl different is that they almost always collaborate with outside companies to make their electronic drum sets. But oddly enough, they don't stick with one partner for more than a few years at a time. Before you know it, they're off developing a brand new drum set with a brand new company somewhere else. There's no steady progression of drum sets that build upon the previous one. They'll put together a new drum set, see if it sticks, and if it doesn't, they'll scrap it and move on to the next partnership. And those partners do a large chunk of the work during development. I can never guess on what they're planning next, which is why I'm always paying attention whenever Pearl comes out with something new. In 2010, Alternate Mode released the DITI, the Drum Intelligent Trigger Interface.
2010 was a pretty important year for Carlsboro, so let's cover them real quick. Carlsboro is a British company that was founded in 1959, but they didn't make any electronic drum sets yet. In 2010, a company called Sound King bought Carlsboro. I believe shortly after this acquisition, Carlsboro began making electronic drum sets. Sound King is a Chinese company that was founded in 1988. So essentially, Sound King electronic drum sets or Carlsboro electronic drum sets are pretty much the same thing because they're all owned by one company. In 2010, Pintech's mesh head license deal with Roland ran out. Pintech had to halt production for a while. Their single ply mesh heads were actually made by Evans, not them themselves. We don't really know everything that was going on behind the scenes at companies like Heart Dynamics and Pintech. These mesh head deals with Roland were not really public. But to the best of my understanding, here's what we do know. Roland's mesh head patent covers two ply mesh heads and the installation of those heads on drum shells. The mesh head patents didn't stop companies from actually making one ply mesh heads. Apparently anybody could do that but you couldn't actually sell them pre-installed on drums without a licensing deal from Roland. That is my understanding of the situation, but of course, I'm no legal expert. But apparently the problem went away in some way, shape, or form, because Pintech was later on going on to make mesh heads again. But of course, many patents like this only applied in the United States or Japan, from what I understand. You have to get a patent in every single country that you want it to apply in. This was a very complex situation, and if you want to learn more about this, check out the 2010 July issue in Digital Drummer Magazine. In 2010, DDrum released the DD-1. This was their first kit in their post-Clavia ownership. For 2010, this price wasn't bad, and I personally liked the sounds. Also, rubber pads were still pretty normal at this price range. But unfortunately, it was all downhill from this point on. Announced in late 2009, but not available till 2010, Yamaha released the DTX 900 series. The first two drum sets in this lineup were the flagship DTX 950K, which cost $5,500, and the DTX 900K. It came with Yamaha's newly developed DTX silicon pads. As you can see from the sound demo, they were significantly quieter than the older pads on the DTX Extreme 2 and 3. The cellular construction of the DTX pad takes the renowned quietness of electronic drums to a whole new level. It proved to be the only worthy competitor to mesh heads in my opinion. The snare and tom pads actually had a different density to make them feel unique. The drum module and the cymbals were pretty much the exact same thing as the previous drum set. The drum module was the DTX Extreme 3, but with a new firmware update and a slightly different coat of paint. They also released the mid-range DTX 550K in March. So before we move ahead to the next year, we need to jump out of the timeline for a second to cover two very large music retailers that sell their own lines of electronic drums. These are two very different companies, but they use the exact same strategy and the exact same manufacturer partners. So let's start with Millennium because they started doing this first. This is a brand owned by the music retailer Tommen. Tommen was founded back in 1954 and is based in Germany. The company began selling OEM branded drum sets in 2003. Since their inception, they've had at least 16 different types of electronic drum sets released and probably more that I didn't even catch. This company is very, very well known in Germany and other countries in Europe, but I've personally never seen one of their drum sets in the United States. The drums are usually branded as Millennium MPS, followed by a series of numbers. Now for the most part, these companies don't really like revealing who makes their drums, but it's been pretty obvious since the beginning that most Millennium drum sets are made by the Chinese OEM Medelli. This is the same company that makes most of the drums for Elisis. But despite popular belief, Medelli doesn't make everything. A few of their drum sets over the years appear to have been made by HXM. We know this because the designs match and the HXM website mentions Tommen as a partner. The simplest way to tell them apart is by the symbols. Drums with Elisis style symbols are Medelli drum sets. Symbols that have labels for each zone and white lines on them, those are usually the product of HXM. Tommen has been so successful with their drums mostly because of their price tags. For example, the MPS 850 is very similar to the Elisis DM10 or an Elisis Crimson, but somehow it's selling for $611. The margins on these drum sets must be incredibly low, or somehow they're cutting costs in a way that I don't really see. Millennium seems to be content with that sub $1,000 price range. Meanwhile, Elisis is pushing into that two and $3,000 price tag territory with some of their higher end kits. Okay, so now let's cover gear for music. But first, here's a message from Clark Howard. Hi, I'm Clark. Hi, I'm Clark. Hi, I'm Clark. And I'm here to show you the DD430 electronic, electronic drum, drum kit by Gear for Music. As, As a gigging drummer and teacher, I'm, I'm a big fan of electronic drum kits. For their There's a great learning and practice and tool. And a great learning and practice tool and advancing for both players. new and advancing players. Gear for Music Limited was founded in 2003 and is based in the UK. 
From what I can tell, they started selling OEM branded drum sets in late 2009 or early 2010. They were sending out review units at least in 2009. Their first drum set was the Gear for Music DD502J. This company essentially follows the template of Tommen's Millennium drum set line. In fact, their first drum set, the Gear for Music DD502J, is the same thing as the Millennium MPS100 from five years before. They order drum from Medelli and HXM and then have the Gear for Music logo imprinted on top of it. And of course, they also probably have certain stipulations about what types of sounds or certain designs that they want. They appear to be using three naming schemes depending on the drum set. They have the HWD series of drums, digital drums, and DD, followed by a series of numbers. DD is a stock Medelli naming scheme. This company has produced at least 21 separate drum sets and multipads since they entered the segment. I have them listed in my History of Electronic Drums PDF. In 2011, Zildjian released the Gen 16 Cymbals and the Gen 16 Digital Vault. The Digital Vault from Gen 16. The most authentic, high-resolution acoustic samples from the world's legendary cymbal maker, Avidus Zildjian. The Digital Vault was a new drum plugin just for cymbals. They sampled some prototype cymbals that had never actually been sold to the public, along with other mainstream offerings. The Gen 16 cymbal system was a set of low-volume cymbals with circular mics at the bell. These mics ran to a DSP processing module. The cymbal module let you change the sound characteristics of the cymbals. So I can't make this sound like a cowbell, but I can take the sound of this cymbal through the pickup and change it electronically to make it sound like lots of other different cymbals. When these first came out, a lot of drummers mistakenly thought that you could possibly plug these into the back of a regular drum module. The whole concept was just so new and unique when it first came out that it took Zildjian a while before they could figure out how to properly explain what it did and what it was. Interestingly enough, you could actually use the sensor and module system on acoustic cymbals if you wanted. That is, if you were willing to drill a hole into it. So far, there have been two versions of these cymbals. The first ones came in silver in 2011, and in 2014, they were replaced with a new bronze version that I really liked the look of. This wasn't just a cosmetic change, though they actually sounded superior. The bronze version is pitched lower and sounds less tinny. I'm also told that Zildjian switched to a different kind of sensor under the bell. Apparently the old version of the sensor suffered from interference issues on a noisy stage. The new version of the sensor didn't have that problem. Now, the Gen 16 concept was a really interesting idea, but it faced a big problem. The cymbals sounded like practice cymbals, but they cost just as much as a regular acoustic cymbal. A 20 inch ride cymbal, for example, would cost $260 and a three-pack of cymbals would cost you somewhere around $900. So they were priced for professional drummers, but they performed like beginner cymbals. The Gen 16 cymbal line ended up being a niche product, almost a fad in a way. Regardless of its shortcomings though, the Gen 16 cymbals are really important because they're pretty much the only reason why low-volume cymbals exist today. A few years after releasing the Gen 16 line, Zildjian decided to adjust the metal formula and released a separate product called the Zildjian L80s. These were darker sounding and I believe slightly quieter. These cymbals were much cheaper to make because you didn't have to bundle in a set of microphones and a cymbal module. All of a sudden, the price tag of getting a set of low-volume cymbals was cut in half or by two-thirds. The Zildjian l 80 sold really well, and it became clear that mics or pickups weren't really necessary. Like, at all. And with that realization, every cymbal company on earth began making cymbals with a lot of holes in them. Some companies would optimize their cymbals to be quiet as possible. Meanwhile, other companies would optimize them for better tone, making them louder. After it became clear that low volume cymbals were very popular, the next logical step for electronic drum companies would be to put triggers on them. So now they really could be connected to a standard drum module. And by the way, as a little piece of cymbal trivia, Zildjian actually sold microphones for cymbals way back in the 1980s. The ZMC-1s were heavily advertised in Modern Drummer magazine for a long time. These of course weren't the same thing as Zildjian Gen 16, but I feel like the concept is still distantly related. In 2011, AudioFront released the DSP Trigger software. This was basically a virtual trigger interface that lived on your computer. You'd plug your drum pads into an audio interface and the software interpreted the signals and created MIDI notes. AudioFront was founded somewhere around 2009 by Robert Jonkman. Originally, the AudioFront website was not for electronic drums. The company would later go on to make a standalone product called the eDrum and Trigger Interface somewhere around 2019. In 2011, Roland updated the TD9 module and the TD9 line of drums. This was called the Roland TD9 V2.0 software update. The new updated version of the module was called the TD9 K2. The new versions of this drum set came with a VH11 hi-hat and a better feeling kick drum, the KD9. 
although it did move a little bit more than the old version. The cheaper variant also had mesh tom pads instead of rubber now. You could also purchase the new module update from Roland on a thumb drive. That update was pirated and posted on different websites fairly quickly. This was also the year that Roland introduced the hugely popular Roland SPDSX pad. This is probably the most used sample pad of all time. It was still being manufactured as of 2020. In 2011, CB, or Convertible Percussion, was founded by Ed Small. Based out of New York, CB is known for making affordable drum triggers by hand. These triggers are center mounted, but mounted onto the side of the shell with a sliding mechanism so you can decide where you want to put the head trigger. This company is also known for their trigger cones. In 2011, Aquarian released the in-head triggers, the in-box, the rim shot, and the hot spot. All these products use FSR sensors. The main benefit is having zero crosstalk, and of course the ability to make the sensor as large or as small as you need it to be. Aquarian would also go on to make their own line of mesh heads as well. The FSR trigger technology was licensed by Midi-Tronics. Alesis was very busy in 2011. They revamped the DM10 Studio Kit, released the DM10X, the DM8 Pro, the DM8 USB Kit, the Perk Pad, the Performance Pad Pro, and the DM6 Session Kit. The DM8 kits were essentially a lower cost version of the DM10 kits. The main excitement in the community was around the DM10X kit though. Without a doubt, this was the largest electronic drum set you could buy at this price range. In 2011, Yamaha released quite a few new drum sets as well, with the introduction of their brand new DTX 700 module. They released the DTX 700K and the DTX 750K. As for their mid-tier kits, they released the DTX 500K, the DTX 520K, and the DTX 540K. The DTX 520 drum set components have stayed almost unchanged over a decade. This drum set has been sold with the DTX 500 module, the DTX 502 module, and the DTX Pro module. Yamaha also announced a partnership with Zildjian in December, releasing the Yamaha DTX 700 SP electronic drum shell pack. This is one of those experimental partnerships that looked really interesting, but was inevitably dropped, most likely after sales didn't do well enough. The simple fact is that having the metal symbols on these drums upped the price of each kit. In 2011, XM released the C-Max 9SR electronic drum set. This was not the company's first electronic drum set, but it's probably their first kit to get on the radar of many electronic drummers. They also became known for their metallic looking rubber cymbals that they launched in 2012. The current iteration of this drum set is the XM eDrum Master Series C-Max 110SR. The company XM was founded in 2006. In 2011, Avatar began selling electronic drums. This is a sub-brand of the parent company HXW. Drums from this company have been sold under both names, such as the HXW Drums SD201C. Drum sets from this company have a unique drum trigger system with the sensor on the bottom of the drum, not touching the top head. The A81 is the flagship at the moment. They also make drum sets for other drum companies. One of them is DB Drums in South America. Now, like I said earlier, Avatar is owned by HXW, but there's also another Chinese OEM we've covered in this video with a very similar name called HXM. Having two competing electronic drum companies based in China called HXW and HXM is very confusing to say the least. The main way to tell them apart is by the symbols. Avatar slash HXW drums have a very pronounced raised ridge near the cymbal edge and the top of their cymbals is a matte black plastic. Meanwhile, HXM drum sets have white lines for each zone, a less pronounced raised ridge near the edge of the cymbal, and the top half of their cymbals are a shiny black plastic. Also, HXM is the only company I'm aware of that makes electronic drums with speakers built into the kick drum. In 2011, Trig Mike was founded. They sell laser-powered drum triggers that don't make contact with your drum head. It senses when your kick drum beater interrupts the laser path via a sticker you place on top of the beater. It has a built-in sound module, so you also don't need to connect this to an external box. It sells for about $200. They also offer other variants that don't use a laser as well. 2011 was the NAMM debut of the Peace VE EPRO 5 electronic drum set. It used metallic cymbals, full acoustic sizes, and acoustic drum heads. RET Percussion made the drum triggers. Apparently this prototype was in really rough shape at the NAMM event. The kit was all single zone drums, and the triggering was not good. There was a short-lived piece Electronic Drums YouTube channel that only posted a series of videos in 2011 featuring playthroughs from the event. 
Jumping ahead to 2012, apparently they dropped that initial concept and now had something called the JPE. I don't think this drum set was actually ever produced either, but it appears to be some sort of hybrid version of the VE. This collaboration marks the end of RET percussion. As far as other electronic drums from Peace, this is the only one that I can find and I don't think it's ever sold at a music store. Sometime around 2012, we saw the introduction of Cow Patty. These are electronic cowbell style pads. I believe the internal sensor is covered by some type of foam or rubber playing surface. A second version was made in 2015. All right, let's move ahead to Mark Drum. This is a really interesting story that a lot of people have forgotten about. Mark Drum is an Italian electronic drum company that began work in 2010. The Mark Drum Yes drum set came out in 2012. Or maybe it was the Mark Drum No. Unfortunately, the company ran into some patent issues with Roland over the fact that Mark Drum was using mesh heads. Remember, Roland's lawyer team remains undefeated. From what I can tell, Mark Drum began looking into different drum head options, but nothing ever came of it. 2016 was the last post they made to the company Facebook page. The sounds inside of the module were actually pretty good for 2012. The main thing that stands out to me about their drum set though was the fact that the cable snake was the drum rack. You'd plug every cymbal and drum into the drum rack and then that would go to the drum module. And for some reason, the company decided to go with those curly phone landline style cables. Overall, it was a very interesting drum set and I'm sad it never really lasted. Unfortunately, Mark Drum no longer exists, but the parent company Mark World does. They own Mark Bass, Mark Audio, and DV Mark. In 2012, the D-Drum Hybrid drum set was released. This was an acoustic drum set with simple one zone triggers built in. The drum shells all had XLR connections built into the side. The drum set is essentially for hybrid drummers. There have been different versions of this over the years in different colors and different numbers of drums, and they also would go on to release a version that came with one ply mesh heads. But I would say this is not a good replacement for an electronic drum set because they don't actually have rim zones. In 2012, Simmons released the SD5X and the Simmons brand name hit rock bottom with the release of the horrible SD Express. They also decided it needed a sequel, so they made the SD Express 2 later on. There have been a couple of versions of this drum set from different companies. If you wanted to buy the drum set in pink for some reason, you could buy the Hitman Drum 1 Super Compact Electronic Drum Kit. At this point, they were slapping the Simmons name on just about anything. In a surprising move, Elises came out with something called the DM Dock at NAMM this year. It was a dock for an iPad with inputs on the back. You'd get the sounds from an official Alesis drum app. It was a really interesting idea, but the problem was latency. This module, or interface if you wanted to call it that, had the highest latency of any module or interface ever recorded. The delay between you hitting a pad and hearing a sound was something like four to five times the delay of a standard drum module. I believe Alesis went this route because iPads and music apps were a huge fad in 2012. Alesis wasn't the only company making weird stuff like this. Also, Alesis was probably excited to make a drum module that didn't need a screen, a processor, or memory inside, which probably made it a lot cheaper for Alesis to manufacture than something like a DM10. But unfortunately, it is now a paperweight because the official app has disappeared from the iOS app store. Also, it still uses the old style of Apple connector, not the lightning one. The whole concept was very interesting though, and I have no doubt that some other company will try it again someday. In 2012, the company that would become Helenson in 2016 began selling the Snare 3 and Snare sensor kits on a newly created website. Sometime around 2014, Helenson began selling their ITM line of triggers, and Helenson is now on their third iteration of that product line. This company also sells the only projector designed for drums. In 2012, Trigger was founded. Over a period of a few years, they began to sell a range of electronic drum products. For a while there, they were pretty much the only electronic drum company making rubber china symbols. They also started selling a lot of different drum triggers, like the K-Rig, N-Rig, On-Rig, and finally, the Bix electronic drum beater. The Bix trigger is very similar to the K&K kick guard from 1993. In 2012, the new Heart e Symbol 3 line was released. These were made from Sabian symbols, and they came in 14 inches for the hi-hat, 16 inches for the crash, and 20 inches for the three-zone ride. The whole package was offered for $900.
You could pretty much say that Heart Dynamics was the godfather of metal electronic cymbals, so it was nice to see that they were continuing to upgrade their design. They were compatible with pretty much every Roland module and many Elises ones. They also introduced a line of plastic cymbals called the Heart Electrified Practice Cymbals in 12 and 14 inch variants. They cost $70 and $80 each. Meanwhile, Roland went all out in 2012. They released eight new drum sets. The HD3, the TD11K, the TD11KV, the TD15K, the TD15KV, the TD4KP, the TD30K, and the TD30KV drum sets. These new drum sets were using what Roland called their Supernatural sound engine. So far, there have been three generations of that. In a really interesting move, the company built a back door into the TD30, which let you access the entire TD20SX module, essentially giving you two modules for the price of one. Roland also carried on with the metallic looking rubber cymbals, but this time with a darker gray color that I liked a bit more. This would be the very last drum set Roland would release with metallic cymbals because the paint would eventually chip off. This was the first time that Roland would release a K variant of their flagship kit with the TD30K. This was an excellent drum set and I bought one. The HD3 was a slight update over the HD1 and apparently just didn't sell very well because Roland never made a successor. Meanwhile, the TD4KP was technically a continuation of the TD4 name, but now in a much more portable form factor, in all rubber pads. I believe the TD4KP stole a lot of sales from the HD line, and possibly made it irrelevant. The Roland TD11 drum set was immensely popular. According to one Roland representative that I've talked to, it was their best-selling electronic drum set, possibly in company history. Oftentimes, it's just the basic, cheap, slightly boring drum sets that sell the best. The main difference between the Roland TD11 and the TD15 modules were, the TD15 had an extra pad input, 100 kits instead of 50, 500 sounds instead of 190, and multi-effects. In 2012, Mario of Alternate Mode licensed the Cap Percussion brand name to the distributor KMC. The result was a new line of beginner electronic drums. The two new kits were the Cap Percussion KT1 for $500, and the Cap Percussion KT2 for $700. The Cap Percussion intellectual property remained owned by Alternate Mode, but the company KMC, who had the rights to make these kits under the Cap Percussion name, changed hands a bunch of times, and it gets kind of confusing. KMC was originally owned by Fender, and then Fender sold them to DW in 2015, and then DW later sold them to Hal Leonard around 2018 or so. This is why when you visit NAMM, you'll see the Cap Percussion products in the same booth as the music notation books made by Hal Leonard. But to be clear, it's kind of just a licensing deal similar to what Guitar Center and Simmons have going on. Sometime around 2013, Robert Rathgeber started a trigger company called R Drums. 2015 is the earliest copy of his website that I could find on the Wayback Machine. These triggers are famous for build quality and solid design. In 2013, Tama became the distributor for Tubox in the United States. This got them into more stores if I remember correctly. Sometimes, if you don't have a large company representing you, it's hard to get into those really big music stores to sell your product. So even though this might sound kind of boring, it was an important step for the company. In 2013, an Axis brand called DDT began working with Geva. They were designing a prototype of a new module they called the Drumcraft E6. This partnership between DDT and Geva would eventually evolve into the Geva G9 drum module years later. As you can see from all these prototype images, the module went through a lot of design changes before eventually turning into the G9. In a slightly surprising move, in 2013, Nord began making electronic drums. This was the release of the Nord Drum 2 and the Nord Pad. If you're sort of seeing some similarities between the Nord Drums and D-Drum, that's because Nord is owned by Clavia, the original owner of D-Drum. Because of that, Clavia, Nord, Tubox, and D-Drum all sort of share some of the same DNA. In 2013, Elisis released the DM7X and the Elisis DM Dock drum set. This was a relatively light year for the company. The DM Dock set was very short-lived, and I don't think Elisa sold that many of them. Basically because you'd have to buy the drum set and also buy an iPad. The DM7X module still lives under the Elisa Nitro brand name. 2013 was a very light year for Roland, the only new eDrum products being the BT1 bar trigger and the HBD20 pad. This year, Pearl released the Pearl True Track hat to be sold with the Pearl ePro Live drum set. Elisus would release an identical version the very next year because both companies were just using the exact same pad from Medelli. This hi-hat looked really cool and sold separately for about $100 if I remember correctly, but it had a horrible reputation for breaking. The only time I've ever even seen one, it was already broken before I got to it. Everybody was hoping that this would just be a cheaper version of a VH11, but it didn't have the build quality. This year, Simmons released the SD1000 for $700. 2013 saw the founding of a brand new company called Artesia by Virgin Musical Instruments. This company makes both the Hitman and Artesia brand of electronic drums. In 2013, Jobeki showed off the JD-1 electronic drum set for 550 pounds. It's possibly a modified Medelli DD-516 with a Jobeki name and Jobeki 3-ply mesh heads. 
I'd never heard of this drum set until I saw a post on Hellfire Electronic Drums about it. I'm guessing this drum set never officially came out. However, there is one eBay listing from Jobeki though, a long time ago. So it's possible that Jobeki had one prototype made and then eventually showed it off a little bit and sold it. Around this time, Jobeki was making full acoustic sized electronic drums, as you can see from this 2013 snapshot of the Jobeki website. Moving ahead to 2014, Easy Drummer 2 and Addictive Drums 2 were released. I haven't been covering every single drum plugin that's come out over this series, but I definitely need to mention these two. Simply because these two pieces of drum software have powered more electronic drums combined than any other drum plugins I can think of. They both sounded fantastic, are really inexpensive, and people are still buying them to this day. Founded in Taiwan in 2014, GoEdrum released the JE6 and the KE6 line of drums. Unlike most Asian electronic drum brands, GoEdrum is not an OEM. The company sent me both of these drum sets for review when they first came out and allowed me to keep them. The drum shells were all made out of steel, very, very heavy duty, and they triggered very well. They had unique one-ply mesh heads that were very, very thick and felt great to play on. But the module was kind of rough and all the cymbals had issues where they would auto-mute themselves. I also found that the kick drum trigger bracket would bend backwards because the original version was too thin. That of course was six years ago and I can't report on what the new drum sets are like. They were most likely growing pains of a brand new company. At least in the electronic drum community, they're not really famous for their modules, cymbals, or drums. They're more well known for their really, really cheap hi-hat controllers. They have sold a ton of these over the years, and they come wired for Roland or Yamaha cymbals. The company would later branch out into cymbal triggers and low volume triggered cymbals as well. Let's have a moment of silence for the Cap Pro Studio drum set. It never came out, but it looked really nice when they originally showed it off in 2014. This drum set used FSR sensors like the Simmons SDX or the Mallet Cat. It had really nice looking shells too. I don't really know what the pad construction was like though. All the symbols kind of looked like they were possibly sourced from HXM. As far as a sound source, apparently it was either going to be sold with the Eve Trigger interface or the Atom drum module. And by the way, the Eve Trigger interface was a DITI trigger interface sold by Alternate Mode. In the Kraft Music NAM demo, they were triggering addictive drums through the system. Unfortunately, this drum set never came out. They did release one drum set that year though, the Cap Percussion KT3. After a year or so of development, On Trigger began making drum triggers that fit on your kick pedal in 2014. The company is based in the Czech Republic. On Trigger is not the first company to make a trigger on a pedal. But to the best of my knowledge, this is the first company to make triggers that work on any pedal, not just one particular brand. And this is the first company to my knowledge that would put the piezo underneath of that footboard pedal. A bunch of companies similar to On Trigger would follow in the succeeding years. I believe the main kind of buyer for triggers like this are metal drummers. In 2014, Alesis released the Sample Pad, the Sample Pad Pro, the Sample Rack, and the Pro X Hi Hats. The Sample Pad and the Sample Pad Pro were the cheapest sample pads that money could buy. They cost half of what the SPDSX and the Yamaha Multi 12 cost. But of course, there's always a catch. The triggering was pretty bad. Unfortunately, Alesis made the situation worse by tying together threshold and sensitivity into one setting. If the company had included a few more trigger settings, then it would have been possible to dial in a much better experience. There was also power brick issues that were very common with these units. In 2014, Roland released the TD1K, the TD1KV, the TM2 drum module, the Noise Eater line, and the KT10 silent kick drum pedal. I was never a giant fan of the TD1K, but it was Roland's first attempt at making a $500 electronic drum set. I just didn't find the pedal to be very convincing to play on because there was no kick drum tower. It was a beaterless design, and the module was very basic. The TM2 module was really nice. It was designed for acoustic drummers that only needed to power a couple of pads and they wanted to play a few samples. The TM2 module filled that role very well. In 2014, Yamaha introduced the DTX502 module, which powered their brand new DTX562K, DTX532K, and the DTX522K. These were very solid drum sets that competed well against the Roland TD11 line. The company also released the DTX400 line, which honestly had the same problems as the TD1 line. No kick drum tower was offered in its base configuration. That same year, Simmons released the SD500, a very basic, inexpensive drum set. Unfortunately, the drum set was not that great. Sometime around 2014, apparently Pintech was bought out. Again, they've been sold somewhere around three times over the years from what I've heard. The new owners of the company released the Pintech PDK1000 for $800 in 2014. And of course, the company still retained a very large back catalog of products they've been building for 20 years or so. In 2014, Deidre released the DD3X and the DD5X. The DD5X is possibly a rebranded Medelli DD518DX. It was clear that by now, D-Drum had stopped trying. They were even using the same numbers and letters in the name of the rebranded OEM product. Let's jump over to Hart Dynamics for a second. A few years before 2014, Peter Hart had sold his business to new owners. The new owners of the company would continue for a few years before they themselves also went out of business. The last major drum set from the company was the 20th anniversary edition drum set. 
It looked beautiful. It was a bit of a last hurrah for the company. By the end of 2014, the website was taken down. Rest in peace, Heart Dynamics. The company had a 25-year run, from 1989 to 2014 or so. This company was very important to the history of electronic drums. They were innovators, and it was sad to see them go. 2014 is my best guess as to the year that Lauren Drums came into being. They don't have an about page with an official founding date, but they did register the website in 2014. Also, the earliest mentions of the company on the vdrums.com forum are from 2015. This company is known for making custom electronic snares, toms, and kick drums and cymbals with very unique drum wraps. Literally any kind of design you can think of, they'll put it on a cymbal or a snare. Unfortunately, this is a case of a company that makes really cool looking products, but when you actually use one, you find out it's not that well designed. In 2015, eDrum MIDI was founded. To be honest, I don't have a lot of information about this company, but they make some very nice looking drum trigger systems. Okay, let's talk about Jobeki for a second. Over the years, this company has gone through a bunch of different cymbal options with their shells. They've offered their drums with Roland and cymbals, two box cymbals, smart trigger cymbals, Zildjian Gen 16 cymbals, and from what I could tell, also some OEM branded rubber cymbals as well. But 2015 was a very important year for the company because they began making their own full metal triggered cymbals. And it's one of the main things they're known for now. In 2015, the Ronka EZ3 trigger was announced. The company Ronka is known for their incredibly heavy duty trigger designs. In 2015, Magnatrack had its crowdfunding launch. The whole idea behind this trigger system is to attach your piezo to the drums via magnets. It's a two-piece system that snaps onto mesh heads or low volume cymbals or even drum shells. Now there have been different versions of this over the years. During my testing of the original version, I found that the magnets were strong enough to hold on to one ply mesh heads, but would fly apart on three ply mesh heads because they were too thick. For the rim zone, you'd actually attach a second magnet via a splitter onto your shell. Unfortunately, my unit broke during testing, but that was five years ago, so maybe my trigger issues have been fixed in the newer variants. It appears that the company has moved on to having the head zone trigger attached via an internal metal mount more in line with the competition. That possibly makes it more secure and less likely to fly apart. If you go on their website today, the company now offers pre-converted low volume cymbals similar to Jobeki, Diamond, and Pintech. They also offer a hi-hat controller called Remedy. Future products the company is working on include a virtual throw-off device, drum links, and the digital e-controller. In 2015, Cap Percussion released the KTMP1. This is a very simple four zone multi pad that was cheap and effective. In 2015, the Elisa's Crimson was released. Oddly enough, there was no official press release for the drum set this year, but it did come out this year. This drum set has lived on through different configurations for about half a decade so far. It's a very large electronic drum set that sold for $1,000 and proved to be very popular. In 2015, Enfused was launched. I believe Infused is owned by the company KHS Music based in Taiwan. Those are the owners of Mapex. This is a conversion pad setup very similar to products from the 90s like Concept One or the Simmons Streamline pads, but now taken a step further. The drum module hosted kits from BFD Eco Light, which was pretty revolutionary at the time. It was a special version made for Infused. The whole drum set sold for $1,700 at launch, depending on how many pads that you bought. This was a conversion system, so the shells were not included. The man behind the system, John Emmerich, would go on to run a lease after and fused fizzled out. The truth is, people just weren't excited about rubber pads anymore. If the company had waited two more years, they could have used mesh, but due to legal reasons, they were stuck with the playing surface everyone was pretty much bored of. It's a really interesting concept, and I wish it had continued. In 2015, Tubox released a drum app for their module, and the new Trigget drum triggers. Meanwhile, Yamaha released the DTX-502 hybrid pack. There were two versions of this one that was just standalone, and a version that came with an acoustic drum set. The DTX-502 Touch app also came out for iOS. This was a great app that was a much nicer way of controlling the module instead of the small screen that was built in. Somewhere around 2015, Century Percussion started a crowdfunding campaign to create a new type of drum trigger system. 328 backers pledged $92,245, which got the product up and running. This is possibly the most powerful, unique, and strange drum trigger system I've ever tested. The drum triggers are also kind of huge with very large plastic bodies that are mounted over a small metallic dot you'd place on the drum head, either acoustic or mesh. This worked as a pickup system. The sounds and signal processing were done on your computer connected by an audio interface. The drum trigger system can do nearly anything, but the fact that it was so expensive mixed with the fact that it was kind of complicated made it more of a niche product. In 2015, Simmons released the SD1500. In a surprising move, the founder of Roland decided at age 85, he wanted to start a brand new company. This new electronic drum company would focus on simplicity, large acoustic sized drums, easy to use drum modules, and organic unprocessed sounds inside. The drum set was not quite ready yet in 2015, but they did announce their first drum module, the ATV-85. 
Meanwhile, over at Roland, they decided to pull the production of the TD-15, only three years into its life cycle, and it was replaced by the TD-25K and KV drum sets this year. They proved to be much more popular than the TD-15. Roland also updated the RT-10 triggers to the RT-30 line. These new drum triggers were self-leveling, looked nicer, and had an extra setting to supposedly give you better triggering results. I tested that extra setting and didn't really notice a pad performance difference. 2015 is also the year that Roland began selling its drum headline separately under the Powerply banner. Roland also released the SPD-20X. This flew under the radar of 99% of electronic drummers because it appears to have been made for the Indian e-drum market. This is essentially an Indian version of the Octopad. It featured 700 sounds and 45 new Indian drum sounds. E-drum facts 2016. Electronic drums were now 50% of total drum sales. In 2016, John Bay was released. This is an electronic hand percussion controller that interfaces with your iPad via a dedicated app. There was a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter for the first prototypes in 2014. In 2016, Alternate Mode released the Jamcat. It featured a playing surface that felt very similar to a thick mouse pad. It triggers very well and is solidly built. It's important to mention that this is a MIDI controller that does not come with any sounds included. Meanwhile, Cat Percussion released the KT4 drum set. I ended up buying one a few years back. Now to me at least, this was one of the last decent fully rubber electronic drum sets to come out. The hi-hat pad came on a dedicated stand, which was very rare at this price range, and the module had better sounds than the competition. The only downside of this drum set was that the build quality was not on par with Roland or Yamaha. In 2016, Nord released the 3P and the Nord 3. These were really nice synthesizer multipads that really reminded me of classic electronic drum brains. In 2016, Alesis announced the development of the Alesis Strike and Strike Pro. Early prototypes and product renders featured metallic-looking rubber cymbals, but no sounds were demonstrated yet. The hype for this drum set at its announcement was intense. Everybody had their eye on this drum set. As far as actual releases in 2016 go, they introduced the Alesis Command, not the Command Mesh, the original one. It was priced at $700, featured a 10-inch mesh snare, an 8-inch mesh kick drum, and rubber tom pads. In 2016, Yamaha introduced the DTX 920K, the DTX 920 HWK, the DTX 720K, the DTX 760K, and the DTX 700 Touch app for iOS. These were all very good drum sets. It appears there was some sort of drama going on with the old hex drum rack that Yamaha used for the flagship DTX 950K kit. Due to legal reasons, they would eventually move away from it. There was also a new DTX 900M module variant. The only notable update was that the SRAM was now built in. Overall, the DTX 900M is still pretty much an updated DTX Extreme 3 from 2008. For the first time in decades, Roland decided to skip the expansion board phase. Instead of making a TD30 KV2 or something like that, this year they introduced the TD50K and KV. There was also a special edition of the TD50K that came with a 22-inch acoustic-sized kick drum. It used a KD82 trigger package inside that you could also buy separately for a while. This is the first time that Roland ever offered cymbals and drums of this size. Offering a 14-inch snare and an 18-inch ride cymbal was something very new for the company. The TD50 had triggering issues at release that caused quite a bit of controversy before it was finally solved with a software patch. The new digital snare and ride immediately became the standard by which everyone else's gear was compared to. However, the TD50 module had a mixed reaction from drummers at release. It wasn't as universally loved as the TD20 and TD30 modules before it. Some drummers loved the way it sounded, others hated it. From what I can tell, it came down to a stylistic choice made by the engineers over at Roland. The kick, snare, and tom sounds were not as warm or large sounding as previous generations. Roland opted for a more punchy and bright tone. It's kind of hard to describe the way the TD50 sounds. Another important thing to mention is that different people were working on this than compared to the team that was working on the TD30, TD20, and TD10, which is partly why this sounded different. Now, of course, the sound editing was deeper and more advanced than ever, but the actual sonic palette that you were working with just didn't click with everybody. But at the end of the day, the module was still very impressive. Roland also released a couple of other things this year as well. There was the FD9, the KT9, the EC10 El Cajon, the EC10M, and the TD1 KPX. This drum set was similar to the TD4 KP, but with a worse drum module and better pads. It was surprisingly expensive for what it was. That is, if you could actually find one. It was kind of hard to buy one of these. 2016 saw the release of Pedal Trigger. It uses a column mount design for the trigger, very similar to Axis. Pedal Trigger came out about two years after On Trigger, which I would say is their main competitor. There is no official posted founding date for the company, 
but they do have a copyright trademark from 2015, and the first snapshot of their website is from October 2016. 2016 is also the same year as the company's first Facebook post, which is why I chose that date. Originally called 42box, Zorman Drums was founded in 2016 and is based in Sweden. The 2016 date is basically my best guess, based on forum activity because the company itself doesn't have an official founding date and they haven't responded to any of my messages. Zorum is a small company primarily known for making a hi-hat box that lets you use a Roland VH11 and FD8 hi-hats with the original 2-box drum at 5. Everybody liked the 2-box drum at 5, but the weakest part of the drum set was definitely its cymbals. So this box became very useful for people that wanted to level up that part of their drum set. The company also created a version for the VH13 in 2017. They had to create a separate version because of the impedance difference between different Roland hi-hats. In 2018, they also introduced a 3-zone ride conversion for the 2-box module and launched a conversion module for the D-Drum 4SE and the Roland VH11. In 2016, Versa Trigger was founded. This is a really interesting wireless trigger system. You add this trigger underneath your mesh head, connect to a small USB hub on your computer, and now you can trigger sounds from drum software. No module, no wires, no MIDI interface with ports on the side required. There have been different variants of this. Soon after release, they added an extra, thicker piece of foam to the trigger. After launch, they would also branch out into making wireless adapters for drum pads in case you had a more standard drum set and didn't want wires. The whole system was a very cool idea, but I don't think the company exists anymore. eDrum Facts 2017 This is the magic year that the Roland patent on mesh heads finally ran its course in the United States. This might sound boring, but it was really, really important to the overall history of electronic drums. The moment this patent ran out, companies everywhere instantly began selling mesh drum sets in 2017 and 2018. On a more somber note, unfortunately, Akuturo Kakahashi died this year as well. This man was very influential in the world of electronic drums. He founded Roland, was one of the leading minds behind the MIDI standard, and around age 85, he founded ATV. In 2017, Superior Drummer 3 was released by Toontrack. While not specifically made for electronic drums, Superior Drummer 3 has the absolute deepest electronic drum integration. It has drum module presets for every single major drum module ever released on the market. It has positional sensing support for the snare and a very, very detailed hi-hat setting adjustment. All of these features made it a very popular option among electronic drummers. 2017 is my best guess as the year that Royalty Hybrid Drums was founded. This is an electronic drum company based out of Brazil. They make electronic drums with mesh heads and rubber cymbals. No module as of the making of this video. Many times it's easy for me to forget about electronic drums based in South America but I feel like companies like this deserve recognition for their contributions to a frankly underserved part of the eDrum community. In 2017, Roland released the TD1 KPX2. This was a slight update to the previous version with a larger kick drum pad to accommodate double beaters. This drum set was incredibly expensive for what it offered, but just like the previous version, it was actually kind of hard to even buy one. Not many websites even offered it. Roland also introduced the SPD1 Waveline, percussion, kick, wave, and electro pads. This drum pad series surprised a lot of people, because versions like this originally came out in 1984 from D-Drum, Emu, and Boss. In 2017, Elisa's finally released the Elisa Strike and Strike Pro drum sets. These drums lit the electronic drum world on fire, and the company was selling these by the truckload. Lifelong Elisa's fans were suddenly born. But unfortunately, the release became a full-blown nightmare over at Elisa's headquarters. It soon became clear that these drums were riddled with significant problems. There were faulty drum racks, trigger plates so thin they would snap in half, and hi-hat problems. Elisa's had to send out a mountain of replacements. Multiple Elisa's Strike Facebook groups were instantly created, and many of the posts were just people showing off cracked trigger plates, devising strategies to fix them, replace them, or support them. It was the worst rollout of any electronic drum set I can think of in years possibly ever. I talked to somebody who worked at Elisis when this happened, and they admitted it was a nightmare for a while. Elisis began work with a manufacturer to fix the problems at the factory. This included redesigning the trigger plate to make it thicker. They also fixed the drum rack problems. They also introduced multiple software updates. This terrible rollout was most likely a case of a company rushing the design process. It's clear not enough testing happened beforehand, or maybe they just ignored all the warning signs and pushed ahead anyway. It would not be the first time a company has done that. Elisus would go on to release three to four software updates to the module. These updates did everything from adding half a gigabyte of free sounds, made the load times faster, improved the graphics, and several trigger updates for better accuracy. As of 2021, the drum set is in much better shape than it was at launch. But there are still some issues the company hasn't quite overcome. Complaints about the hi-hat performance and also the ride symbol. But Elisus has still come a very long way from when it first launched.
Elisis also released a new version of the Crimson, called the Crimson II. This drum set was very similar to the original, but had some notable changes. Elisis increased the number of sounds that were built in, changed the color of the screen from blue over to red, and then added a second crash symbol. In 2017, Yamaha announced the EAD-10, the Yamaha DT-50 drum triggers, and the DD-75. The EAD-10 proved to be a very inexpensive way to mic your acoustic drums, record them, layer in samples, add effects, and add electronic drum pads. It was an interesting concept that nobody expected. In 2017, Jobeki released their low volume triggered cymbals. From what I can tell, they released it just slightly before Diamond Drums. The low volume cymbal revolution was kicked off by Zildjian with the Gen 16s and the L80s, and it was only a matter of time before companies would start adding triggers to them. Early versions of these cymbals would have metallic colored edges to reduce false triggering, but they later switched over to black bands on the edge instead. Diamond Drums also showed off some low volume triggered cymbals in November of 2017. They were either sold that year or possibly early 2018. When companies will show off a product prototype and when they actually sell it on social media, it's kind of fuzzy sometimes. 2017 was the year that the ATVA drums were released. They were offered in four different variants. Two kits of different sizes offered with and without the 85 module. The drum sets featured large rubber cymbals with 360 triggering and a surprisingly thin design. ATV stepped into a market that already had a lot of competition. Jobeki, Diamond, Field, Muzio, Drumtech, Pintech, and Boom Theory all offered full-size electronic drums already. But ATV was unique because they offered something the other companies didn't, a full drum set that came with high-end rubber cymbals on par with Roland and a drum module. The amount of money and time that goes into making the drum module and high-end rubber cymbals is such a high barrier that most companies never do it. This gave ATV a bit of a competitive advantage, at least for the kind of customer that wanted rubber cymbals. In 2017, Pearl released the Pearl Mimic Pro drum module. This release came as a surprise to a lot of people. It was essentially a drum plugin, Steven Slate Drums 5, placed inside of a thick tablet with a lot of inputs and universal pad compatibility. It was like the DM Dock, but like, actually good. This was an innovation no one expected Pearl to make. It was even cheaper than its rival TD50. The earliest versions of the firmware were very rough, but it is now a very polished, capable drum module. This was definitely designed to be a standalone product, but it was also sold in a drum set configuration called the Pearl Mimic with Masters MCT for $6,350. It was a Pearl ePro Live, just with a better drum module. This was not a good deal. You were essentially paying an extra $4,000 for nicer shells that you would never actually hear, and a module that you could have just bought separately. The Mimic being sold with budget Bedelli cymbals and ePro Live pads just didn't make much sense. The drum set itself wasn't sold for very long, but the module sold separately and became very popular with certain parts of the eDrum community. Okay, so let's wrap up that Guitar Center and Corval Inc. versus Simmons feud. Dave Simmons worked out a deal with the retail giant, which culminated in a new line of electronic drums released in 2017. Dave Simmons owned the brand name and gave Guitar Center a long-term license to use that name. Apparently one part of the deal was the stipulation that Guitar Center actually had to try harder to make nice electronic drum sets. From now on, they couldn't just make rebranded stock kits like they were used to doing. Apparently Dave worked on the SD2000, mostly on the look, feel, and quality of the new flagship. Jim Norman, previously of Elises and Roland, headed up the new Simmons brand. The products released this year were the ST1 Trigger, the SD550, the SD350, and the SD2000. This brand new flagship was initially priced at $1,300. It featured a very solid drum rack with ball mounts. The module had samples from classic Simmons drum brains and modern sounds as well. It featured faders and possibly the first ever color screen ever seen on a commercial electronic drum set. The size of the cymbals and drums were very large for the price as well, and it featured mesh heads. In order to get a feel for what drummers thought of this drum set, I pulled hundreds of electronic drummers back in 2017. It turns out this drum set was kind of controversial. There were a couple of odd things about the drum set. First was that there were no real bell parts of the cymbals, they were just flat cutouts. The cymbals were also incredibly hard, and at least on the drum sets that I tried, they didn't really sway when you hit them. Also, when I tested the drums, it had very, very bad machine gunning, the worst I'd ever heard at this price range. I'm told this was fixed in a future software update later on. I don't think this drum set sold very well, because it initially went on sale for $1,300, but the price tag was soon slashed to $1,100 early on. As of the making of this video, there's never been a true successor to this drum set. In 2018, D-Drum released the DD Beta Pro and the DD Beta XP2. In 2018, Muzio Drums released the Element line of drums. They utilized 3D printing to make the drum triggers inside of the shells, and the trigger placement style was very similar to ATV. In 2018, Yamaha introduced the DTX-402 line. This included the DTX-402K, 
432K, and the 452K for $700. The drums had the best sound in class, but unfortunately had all rubber pads. The drum set line just didn't do much to spark interest from electronic drummers. In 2018, Elisa's released the Nitro Mesh for $350, the Surge for $500, the Command for $700, and the Strike Multipad. The Strike Multipad was announced a long time before the average customer could actually get their hands on one. It proved to be a very solid competitor against the Roland SPDSX and the Yamaha Multi-12. Also, Elisus apparently renamed its China wing of the company over to this. Google Translate appears to think this translates to Alice. In 2018, the Pearl Mallet Station was released. Its main competition would be the Mallet Cat from Alternate Mode. The Mallet Station feels really nice with unique silicon type zones. The Drum at 3 module from 2Box was announced years before, but because of production delays, it took until 2018 before people could actually buy it. This was the very first mid-tier drum module from 2Box. It immediately proved to be a solid option for the price. It had individual inputs, solid sounds, and universal pad compatibility. A Zauramon trigger box was no longer needed for Roland hi-hats anymore. In 2018, Goedron released its own line of low-volume triggered cymbals. This was a popular trend many companies were jumping in on at this time. Also, the AE-8 and the QE-6 drum sets came out sometime around this time frame. In 2018, Geva announced a new line of electronic drums to be released in partnership with DW for the hardware, Remo for the drum heads, and DDT for work with the module and triggers. It would take a few years before this drum set would finally come out. It was evident that this drum set was aimed directly at TD-50 customers, but with a drum module that reminded you of a Pearl Mimic Pro. In 2018, Alternate Mode released the Hybrid Pad, the Hybrid Head, and the FTB Trigger Box. The first two were pretty much just new versions of the Aquarian on-head and in-head products. I spoke to the owner of Alternate Mode, and I was told that it made more sense for the products to be sold under their banner versus Aquarian, who's known more for acoustic heads. Meanwhile, over at Roland, this ended up being one of the busiest years in their company history. They released the RDH line of hardware, the TM6 Pro, the RT Mic S, the SPD SX SE, the TD1 DMK, the TD17 KL, the TD17 KV, the TD17 KVX, the TD25 KVX, the TD50 KVX, and then finally the TD50 KVRM. So the RM and the TD50 KVRM stood for Randall May Edition. It cost $8,500 and was a limited run of about 50 units. It came with different drum wraps, an extra side snare to the left of the drum set, hydraulic cymbal mounts, and floating tom mounts that used magnets. The TD50 KVX was essentially the TD50 KV Special Edition, but now it was an official drum set in the lineup. The kick drum shells were made by a different company too. The TD25 KVX was a surprising new entry into the series that nobody expected. It had a smaller version of the TD50 KVX kick drum. It also essentially brought down the S variant of a snare on the TD30 KV over to this mid-range set, now that the digital snare was a thing. Meanwhile, the TD17 was a much needed breath of fresh air to the one to $2,000 price range. Almost every other option had been stale for years in that price segment until this came along. The KV and KVX variants of the module offered Bluetooth, while the KL did not. That was the only difference between those modules. The larger 12-inch snare was a welcome change to these drum sets, and the cheaper lighter VH10 hi-hat was also good to see. In 2018, we saw the first electronic drums made by eDrum Center. Originally, the triggers were sourced from Stealth Drums, but they have now moved on from that original design. In 2018, ATV announced the EXS1, the ATV EXS2, the EXS3, the EXS4, and the EXS5. These were smaller, more affordable, pad-based electronic drum sets as compared to their ATV Artist series. Drum companies make a good chunk of their money from intermediate and beginner level electronic drums, so this was a logical move on ATV's part. All five drum sets shared the same module, which is a cheaper version of the ATV85, and it was almost identical in what it could do. While the naming scheme makes all these drums look very similar, you could actually split them into two separate classes. ATV designed the first two to use cheaper cymbals than the rest of the line, and apparently there have been two variants of these drum sets as well, the MK1 and 2. When I was talking to representatives from ATV USA about these drums, I was basically told those first two kits weren't really being pushed for the United States market. Only the EXS3 and 5 were. Many drummers have probably already forgotten about the EXS4 drum set because it appears to have been very short-lived. There's only a couple of websites that have ever even listed it, and I don't think any of them are actually in English. So that leaves us with the two kits that I've actually tested, the EXS3 and 5. They turned out to be very solid drum sets. The triggering was excellent, the cymbals were the same type that came on their flagship line, 
And if you prefer the raw, unprocessed sounds of the A-Drums line, you would also like this module. This was a very busy year for the company because in addition to those five drums, they also announced the ATV A-Frame. This is a percussion pad that has a wooden frame and a plastic textured playing surface. You can create a lot of different tone textures by scratching the head, flexing the frame, or just playing on it. The whole concept shares a lot of DNA with the original Korg Wave Drum from 1994 when it comes to the technology behind everything. All right, let's take a quick break from the timeline to talk about a company called Kit Toys. In episode five of this series, I mentioned that the website had disappeared from the internet. I assumed the company had went out of business. It turns out I was wrong. Kit Toys had a name change over to Drone Triggers, so the company is still around. This company appears to be a one-man operation, like many of these smaller electronic drum trigger companies out there. And judging from his Facebook page, he is constantly tinkering with his designs, always testing out his cymbals, drum triggers, trying to see what works best. Some of his designs really remind me of stuff from R Drums and Ronka. In 2019, Pintech released a full range of low-volume triggered cymbals. This includes ride cymbals, crashes, hi-hats, and china cymbals. At this point, if you wanted a triggered low-volume cymbal, you had a lot of options. You could buy one from Pintech, Go e Drum, Jobeki, Diamond Drums, and Magnatrack. Pintech was also offering them on their full acoustic-sized Phoenix Pro Series drum set. In 2018, the trigger company Foot Blaster came on the scene. This is a very similar setup to what On Trigger does. The piezo sits underneath the bass plate. When the pedal makes contact, you get a trigger pulse. Electronic Drum Facts 2019 Unfortunately, Joe Polar, the creator of the Syndrome in the 1970s, passed away. He was incredibly influential in the early days of electronic drums and will be missed. Check out episode one of this series for more details on his work. 2019 was a very light year from Roland after the onslaught of drum sets from the year before. First was the unexpected Roland TM1 hybrid drum module. This was designed to be on the floor and had foot switches built in. Roland also produced its most expensive electronic drum set they had ever made, the TD50 Nocturne. This sold for $9,000. It was the same design as the TD50 KV RM, but that extra $500 price bump got you a darker silver color to the drum rack, different shell wraps, and a cool resonant head we hadn't seen before. Only 50 units were said to be produced. I also believe the TD50 K180 made its appearance in 2019 as well. In 2019, the Stealth Drums ISM6 was released. This was a six sensor trigger system for converting acoustic drums over to electric. It cost $100. The man behind Stealth Drums, J-Man, didn't sit still with his drum trigger designs. He was always improving them over and over and over again. This IM6 was the culmination of all those designs he'd made over the years. I bumped into him this year for the first time at NAMM. I was at the two box booth looking at the Drummit 3 module and he was walking by. Unfortunately, J-Man would pass away the very next year. The electronic drum community lost not only a great source of information about triggers, but we also lost just a really good guy. Right before he died, J-Man posted a very in-depth walkthrough of his personal kit and his drum triggers throughout the years. Check out his Facebook page if you'd like to watch it. In 2019, the two box drum at five MK2 was announced at NAMM and later the Speedlight drum set. The two box drum at five MK2 was basically a beefier version of the drum at three module released a little bit earlier. Let's check in on Go e Drum. It appears they began a Kickstarter for a new line of electronic drums in 2019. Unfortunately, they only raised $52, but I think they still pushed ahead and made the drum set anyway. While announced in 2018, it wasn't until 2019 that Pearl began shipping the brand new Pearl eMerge. The USA release wouldn't be until 2020, with a price tag of about $4,000. $4,000 was a new price tier that many companies were targeting around this time. I'm sure if you inflation adjusted, this would also be around the same price tag of the original version of the Pearl E-Pro Live. The Pearl E-Merge is an interesting collaboration between Pearl and Korg. Korg is behind some of the sensors, the electronic sounds, and the percussion sounds. Some electronic drummers, however, were disappointed that Pearl started from scratch on this module. They could have made a Pearl Mimic Lights type of module, but Pearl decided not to go that route. All of that aside, the module wasn't bad. The playing surface was also very interesting. It was a very thick mesh head design formed by multiple layers of material. This makes them feel more realistic than mesh heads, but the cost comes in the form of higher noise. This has not gotten an especially positive reception from the e-drum community, and from what I can tell, not many people have actually bought one yet. In 2019, Jobeki released new three and four post trigger systems. Also, they came in black now. Previously, they only came in unpainted stainless steel. In 2019, Mutsio Drums released the MX line. These came with larger maple shells that were also more expensive. They were also showing off a prototype of a new metal symbol in NAMM this year. As of the making of this video, the prototypes have not been realized as an official product yet. This year, Yamaha released a software update for the EAD-10. 
This new update added a talkback function and low volume drum set adaptability. In 2019, Alesis released the Strike Pro SE for $2,500. There was also the Alesis Turbo Mesh for $320. The Strike SE added a much larger kick drum, a larger hi-hat which trigger better, and new white mesh heads that used a slightly different material construction. These were all very solid upgrades to the Strike line that were very much needed. In 2019, Simmons released the SD200, the SD1200, and the SD600. I did a full review of the SD1200 on the channel. This drum set was a little bit odd, because it was a smaller, more dumbs-down version of the SD2000, and it initially sold for the same price, although it would get a lot cheaper in the years to come. I feel like they tried to make improvements based on feedback they got from the SD2000, which was nice to see, but there were some significant problems, strong hot spotting on the cymbals and a poorly designed kick drum. In 2019, we saw a new generation of cymbals from Field Electronic Drums, this time with no visible screws or rivets in the cymbals. Over at ATV, they announced a new line of electronic drums, the ATV A-Drums Artist Pro. These are going to be larger than the regular ATV Drums Artist series, and they were also going to be acoustic drums that could sound good in either configuration. Along with that would be an increased price tag. There was also a module expansion announced called the ADIO. As of the making of this video, neither of these products have come out. As of the 2020 NAM convention, I've spoken to people at ATV and have been told the products have been shelved indefinitely. Okay, that's it for the 2010s, now let's move ahead to 2020. As this new decade began, 2020 actually got off to a strong start. There were impressive new drum sets featured at Winter NAM. It was a great two months, but unfortunately this would all be overshadowed by COVID-19. As we all know, most things, including drums, are made in China. And China was the first country to be hit by the new virus. After a lag time of about a month or two, music stores in countries around the world had issues keeping drums in stock. Mid-sized and small electronic drum companies were affected because finding parts was getting harder. Large electronic drum companies that had total control over manufacturing and the supply chain didn't have as many issues though. But right after COVID hit, another problem emerged. Trade sanctions between the United States and China really hurt the drum companies. Increased costs were passed on the customers almost immediately. However, an unexpected silver lining appeared. Electronic drum sales were actually surprisingly strong as drummers found themselves stuck at home with nothing to do. In 2020, Elisa's released the Crimson 2 Special Edition. It's essentially a Crimson 2, but now it had the white mesh heads. ATV had a really rough time in 2020. The company pulled out of the United States, Canada, and Australia. ATV USA went out of business. The exact reasons for why this happened are still slightly unclear to me, and probably will be for a long time. ATV said that the USA China tariffs and COVID-19 are what made the USA arm of the company go out of business. But I feel like there are some deeper issues we don't know about. Most companies were hit by the exact same tariffs, and everybody had to react to COVID-19. This was not a unique problem that only ATV faced. But regardless as to why it happened, it's a shame that ATV USA is gone. They had a very positive impact on the electronic drum market. In 2020, the G9 series of drums from Geva were finally available to buy in Europe, and in the second half of 2020, you could buy them in the United States as well. Apparently, Geva wanted to manufacture drums in a factory in the United States, but COVID caused delays. So the company decided to ship kits directly from Germany over to US dealers. And apparently, Geva was shipping these drum sets with Gibraltar hardware, which was initially supposed to be special DW hardware. We also saw that they were selling all these components separately, the drums, the cymbals, and the module. Some of the sound selection was a little bit limited inside of the module, so they began working on recording a new batch of sounds for the online store. In 2020, Cap Percussion slash Alternate Mode released the KT200 drum set, the KTM1 module, and the reintroduction of the Trap Cat. This drum set is a rebranded Nuex DM5S. Meanwhile, that new Cap Percussion module is a rebranded Two Box module. But unfortunately, it appears this has been cancelled or postponed because when you Google this module, the only result is my YouTube video covering it at NAMM 2020. Founded in October of 2018, but not playable till NAMM 2020, F-Note came out with a couple of new lines of electronic drums. This company was founded by some engineers that left ATV to make their own drums. They brought a lot of the same concepts from ATV, but with modifications. F-Note is distributed by the budget electronic drum brand Artesia. Both Artesia and Hitman are both owned by Virgin Musical Instruments. But after talking with the company, it turns out that Virgin Musical Instruments does not actually own F-Note. They apparently just handle the distribution and host the website. Jumping ahead to the end of 2020, it now appears that the lineup is the F-Note 3, the F-Note 3X, the F-Note 5, and the F-Note 5X. Based out of Michigan, Dream Trigger began as a Kickstarter campaign in 2017 to tackle a simple problem. Everybody has like two sounds they need for a song on a gig, 
but they end up spending $700 on a huge multipad. This takes up a lot of space if you have very simple needs. So Dream Trigger made a two-zone multipad built on top of a laser drum trigger that you can mount on the rim of your drum. The whole concept reminds me a lot of the Sims Drum Hugger, but now with a trigger and a module built in. In 2020, Yamaha canceled the DTX 900 series, the DTX 700 series, and the DTX 502 series. This was a very strange announcement because there was no immediate release of new drum sets to replace them. But after a little bit of radio silence, eventually the DTX 6 series of drums was released. It stuck with most of the same pads from the DTX 502 line, but now it had a new module. And if you read the manual for this kit, it shows signs that further higher end drums are in the works, but those are yet to be seen, possibly even using mesh heads. In 2020, we saw the release of a new trigger from Pad Tech. Meanwhile, over at Roland, they had an incredibly busy year. For the first time in a while, they released a new set of cymbals, the CY14CT and the CY16RT. These were the first flexible cymbals the company had ever made. As far as V-drums go, they released the TD-07KV, the TD-27K, and the TD-27KV. Roland also made a new line of drums called the V-drums Acoustic Design Series, or VAD for short. This new line of drums included the VAD-306, 503, and 506. Roland had been bleeding sales in the 3 to 6,000 full-size segment for about 10 years or so, mostly to companies like Drumtech, Jobeki, Field, Muzio, Diamond, and others. So they finally came out with their own range of electronic drums to compete. Overall, Roland had a very strong lineup of brand new drum sets. They also got in trouble with the government this year. Apparently, they were ordered to pay a fine of four million pounds by the UK government because of resale price maintenance. What does that mean exactly? Well, Roland wouldn't let companies set their own prices for their gear below a certain point set by Roland headquarters. Apparently, this is illegal in the UK. They had been doing this from about 2011 through 2018, and they weren't the only ones either. Fender, Casio, and Korg were also fined. We also saw the release of the new XDM7X this year. This kit reminds me of a Roland TD25KV. The drum set features a color screen, all mesh pads, and decent looking cymbals. In 2021, Jobeki announced a new line of rubber cymbals. These were to be offered in 12, 14, and 16 inch variants. This was not the first time that Jobeki had sold rubber cymbals, but it had been a very long time. Metallic cymbals are nice, but they're not for everybody. So this was a nice addition to their product portfolio. I believe they partnered with an OEM to manufacture the cymbals with a Jobeki logo on them. But at the moment, all we really have are low resolution pre-production photos to go off of. The best guess that I've seen so far is that these are made by the same company that produces Lemon Drums. But that's just a guess so far. We won't know for sure until the cymbals are actually released in a few months. And that is the history of electronic drums. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you sat through all four hours of this history series. In total, it took me about six months to complete this documentary. A big, big thank you goes out to the people on Patreon that patiently supported this channel even though there was a pandemic and when I was going months without releasing a video because I was working on this series. The script for this series ended up being so long, I decided to edit and release it as an ebook. If you'd like to read it in PDF form, the Complete History of Electronic Drums Timeline 1964 through 2021 is available to all Patreon supporters of 65 Drums. If you're interested, I'll have a link to that in the description below. Have an amazing day, keep drumming, and I'll see you all in a few.